This video discusses house dust mites and strategies for reducing their suffering. In a video in May 2016, I reported that I couldn't find any dust mites in my house, except maybe in the basement. I looked in piles of dust, on clothes, on my bed and pillow, and on myself, and I didn't find any mites. Now it's August and has been humid for a while, and finally I'm able to find what I assume are dust mites. Here I've pointed my microscope camera on a calibration ruler at the same distance as the distance to the floor in my video. Based on these measurements, the mites seem to be roughly one-fourth to one-half of a millimeter long. Wikipedia says dust mites are usually 0.2 to 0.3 millimeters long, and this page says adults are about 0.5 millimeters long. So the measurements seem about right for these to be dust mites. Of course, it's unfortunate that there are now dust mites because dust mites, like other invertebrates, are born involuntarily into short lives that may end in painful deaths. This page reports that a female dust mite lays about 50 eggs. This paper reports a similar number. But in a stable population, at most two of a female's offspring will survive to reproduce on average. The rest will die, perhaps painfully, and many offspring probably die soon after birth. Of course, if dust mites are just encountering a new supply of skin flakes, then more than two of a mother's offspring may survive on average. But eventually the population will catch up to food supply, and this will re-establish the Malthusian situation in which most offspring die early. Even those mites who do manage to reproduce live only one to two months as adults before they too die, perhaps painfully. While I am able to find dust mites now, they aren't as numerous as I expected. I still wasn't able to find any on my bed, pillows, or sheets. I looked through dirty clothes for about 20 minutes, and I was only able to find one dust mite in the process, namely this mite that was on a sock that had lots of skin flakes due to being used a lot. I don't know how representative my findings are for other homes. In the literature, it seems as though dust mites are quite common and numerous, so maybe my house is a bit of an outlier here. I also didn't see any dust mites on dust that was on surfaces above the floor level, such as on dressers. I only found dust mites on the floor, concentrated in regions with the most dense dust and most of them were in the room where I spend most of my waking hours. They were especially concentrated in cracks between floorboards. I found only a few dust mites upstairs, between a bathroom tile and the wall. I also looked for mites on my own skin and hair. Despite searching for about 15 minutes, I only found one thing that seemed to be an invertebrate, namely this thing on the skin of my stomach. Maybe it's a mite, but I can't tell. Is it a stray dust mite? Is it another one of the mites discussed on this page? You can ignore the pink stuff around it. I was drawing on my skin with a pen to narrow down the exact location of the creature. This page says, quote, It is not uncommon to find thousands of mites in a single gram of house dust. A gram is about the weight of a paper clip. End quote. This paper found about 1.5 mites per milligram of dust in mattresses of normal volunteers. I think my floor had fewer dust mites per milligram of dust, although I don't have a scale with which to measure exactly. Most of the dead skin flakes on my floor have no mites on them at all. In this video, I'm showing those patches of dust that had mites in them, but most of the dust patches on the floor lacked mites. 
This is, of course, good news. That said, the absolute number of dust mites on my floor is probably at least in the hundreds, which is still a morally significant tragedy. In general, a bed can hold millions of dust mites. Does sleeping in beds crush lots of dust mites? Does using a dust mite infested pillow crush some dust mites? Presumably walking on dust laden floors crushes mites. How about sweeping up dust into a dust pan with a broom? Do the broom bristles damage the dust mites? How about vacuuming them up? And if dust containing dust mites is thrown out into the trash, does it get crushed in garbage trucks or landfills? Do dust mites on clothes get drowned or heated to death in the wash? These are lots of questions that I'd be curious to learn more about. Blowing dust out of the way with your mouth seems to be one way to reduce how many dust mites you step on without too much risk of injuring the mites. So I often do this. I checked for dust mites in the materials accumulated inside a vacuum cleaner. I didn't find any dust mites in about 10 minutes of searching, but this vacuum cleaner was mostly used to clean up wood shavings and fibers, not skin flakes, so we can't conclude very much from this. As a small and inadequate test of the effect of sweeping on dust mites, I swept up a bit of dust with a broom into a pink dust pan. I then checked the dust mites in the pan. Some were moving about as if nothing had happened. Others seemed to be squirming around in place, maybe trying to regain their footing. Unfortunately, I couldn't really tell if any mites were permanently injured by the broom, because I wasn't really able to see non-moving mites. Given the resolution of this microscope, the main way I can see mites is if they're moving around. So I remain nervous about the effect of sweeping on mites. In any case, trying to avoid crushing dust mites might be less important than reducing their populations. A smaller population means that fewer mites will be born and thereby forced to endure suffering. It's actually fairly common to try to reduce dust mite populations because some people are allergic to dust mite, shed skins, and fecal material. Although the measures that are taken to reduce allergen exposure aren't necessarily the same as those that would reduce dust mite suffering. And some anti-dust mite interventions like heating mites seem pretty painful. One way to reduce dust mite populations is to decrease home humidity. This page says, quote, house dust mites have a difficult time surviving when the relative humidity is below 50%. Improving ventilation and installing a dehumidifier can often help to reduce populations indoors. Since fabric covered surfaces retain air and body moisture better than less porous materials, e.g. wood, vinyl, linoleum. Removal or modification of carpets, bedding, overstuffed furniture, etc. will further help to reduce humidity and favorable habitat for dust mite development." End quote. This page adds, quote, keep temperature under 70 Fahrenheit and humidity levels below 50%. Dust mites, as well as other allergens, thrive on high humidity. Homes with air conditioning constantly have lower mite counts than non-air conditioned homes. This can be accomplished with a couple of relatively inexpensive and long-lasting dehumidifiers. These have the advantage of making the air more comfortable in the summer, reducing the need for air conditioning." End quote. This page says, quote, well-ventilated homes in dry climates contain few dust mites. Homes with a relative humidity that consistently rises above 50% can contain more than 100 dust mites per gram of dust. 
to reduce dust mite numbers, a relative humidity of less than 50% must be maintained for several weeks. Any fluctuation in humidity, however brief, seems sufficient for dust mites to remain and reproduce. Daily activities such as air conditioning and showering will cause humidity levels to fluctuate in portions of the home." End quote. This paper has a section on reducing relative humidity, RH. Quote, Laboratory studies have shown that adult mites die of dehydration in 5 to 11 days, depending on temperature, 25 degrees Celsius to 34 degrees Celsius, when continuously exposed to RHs of 40% or 50%. Field studies report that homes located in dry climates, such as those of the mountain states or upper Midwest, have few mites and little mite allergen present. In dry climates, use of evaporative coolers can raise RH enough to support mite populations. The use of high-efficiency dehumidifiers and air conditioners in homes has recently been shown to be both practical and effective in reducing RH and thus mite populations. It was found that in a humid temperate climate, it is possible to maintain RH below 50%, which reduces mite and allergen levels over time. In addition, maintaining a mean daily RH below 50%, even when RH rises above 50% for 2 to 8 hours, effectively restricts population growth of D. farinae and thus the production of allergen. To completely prevent population growth of D. farinae, RH must be maintained at 35% or less for at least 22 hours per day when daily RH is 75% to 85% for the remainder of the day. In temperate climates, it is possible to maintain RH at less than 50% by using high-efficiency dehumidifiers and air conditioning. In this environment, this intervention may be the only control measure needed. New carpets, mattresses, pillows, and sofas should not develop mite populations in this lower humidity environment. Whether dehumidification is practical and effective in warm, humid climates, such as that found in Florida, remains to be determined." End quote. One caveat to add here is that while air conditioning reduces dust mite numbers in a house, it doesn't eliminate the food source that the dust mites would be eating the skin flakes will probably end up in a landfill. If it's possible for dust mites or other skin-eating bugs to live in landfills, then maybe air conditioning only delays mite suffering rather than preventing it. However, I assume it's hard for mites to live in landfills because conditions can be anaerobic. But investigating this point further seems important since it affects whether air conditioning and dehumidification are actually useful ways to reduce mite suffering. I would probably discourage throwing dust outdoors because there it will degrade aerobically and some of its consumers might be invertebrate animals. Cleaning up dust regularly might also reduce dust mite populations, although if there are already dust mites on skin flakes, then sweeping or vacuuming them might cause them injury. Also, I wonder if dust mites could still live in trash cans and vacuum cleaner bags, in which case maybe vacuuming up dust doesn't reduce dust mite populations. I don't know since I haven't looked into this. One potential solution is to put skin flakes into the toilet or down the sink drain. That way, the energy and nutrients in the skin will be consumed by bacteria in your septic field, if you have one, rather than by more sentient dust mites. So I try to throw fresh skin flakes into the toilet or drains when possible. However, for dust that has been on the floor for a long time, there's a higher risk that dust mites are already on it, in which case putting skin flakes down the drain may drown dust mites, which is probably painful for them. 
In general, it seems probably bad to kill dust mites because the dust they would have eaten will now be able to be eaten by other dust mites. So the total dust mite population isn't necessarily reduced in the long term. But the number of painful deaths per unit time is increased. On the other hand, if you kill some dust mites in the process of preventing the skin flakes from being available to further dust mites, such as by putting the skin flakes in the toilet, then killing a few dust mites in the process might be a cost worth paying, although I think we should always be cautious about being too quick to painfully kill bugs. There's a similar trade-off with washing clothes that contain skin flakes. Washing will hurt whatever dust mites are already on the clothes, but washing also removes dust flakes and prevents any further mites from eating them. Washing clothes frequently might be good because if you wash clothes soon after wearing them, mites will have less time to climb onto the clothes. Washing frequently also helps prevent clothes moths and carpet beetles. However, washing frequently also uses more water, which might be bad if it increases septic plant growth, and washing frequently also requires more energy and time. An alternate approach which I use is to store dirty clothes in sealed bags to keep bugs from getting onto them before they're washed. One pitfall here might be if a few bugs get into the bag and then multiply inside it. But given that the life cycle of dust mites is about a month, this concern may not be huge unless pregnant females enter the bag and lay eggs right away. This paper says, quote, washing sheets, pillowcases, blankets, and mattress pads at least weekly in hot water, 55 degrees Celsius, 130 degrees Fahrenheit or higher, kills mites and removes most allergen. Washing in warm or cold water does not kill most mites, but probably removes most allergens because allergens are water soluble. The key to killing mites in a tumble dryer is to maintain the lethal temperature for a sufficient time. Tumble drying blankets can kill all mites if a temperature greater than 55 degrees Celsius, 130 degrees Fahrenheit, is maintained for 10 minutes. Chang et al. found that the thermal death point and time required to kill mites was about the same in air as in water and reported that mites exposed to air at 60 degrees Celsius died within 10 minutes." End quote. I don't know about mites in particular, but in many insects, heat is extremely painful, so I would guess that mites dying of heat in either the washer or dryer have some of the worst possible deaths, which is very sad. This might be one argument against washing clothes in hot water. Showering may help to prevent some dust mites, especially if you rub skin flakes off your body in the shower so that they go directly into the drain. That said, I don't necessarily recommend showering more often, not just because it takes time, but also because if you have a septic field, putting more water down the drain might possibly increase plant growth on the septic field, although I don't have data on whether this effect is significant on the margin. This paper says, quote, carpets, draperies, and upholstery fabrics collect detritus and hold moisture, providing an ideal habitat for mite breeding. In humid climates, it is recommended that carpets be removed in favor of hard surfaces. Likewise, draperies and curtains can be replaced with blinds or shades. To further reduce infestations, Fabric upholstery can be replaced with vinyl or leather covering on cushions. Wooden furniture with no fabric is also recommended." End quote. Relative to the goal of preventing mite suffering, I probably support all of the recommendations just read, although vegans would oppose leather coverings. It's easier to sweep up skin flakes from wooden floors than from carpets, which means more of your skin flakes can decompose in a landfill. 
This page says the most effective way to reduce dust mite allergens, quote, is to enclose the mattress top and sides with a plastic cover or other dust mite impervious cover. Put an airtight plastic or polyurethane cover over your mattress. Enclosing the mattress and pillows in a dust mite cover virtually eliminates the mites here, end quote. However, you still produce skin flakes at the same rate as before, whether you have a cover or not, so I assume that while a bed cover might reduce your exposure to the allergens, it doesn't necessarily reduce total dust mite populations, since more dust mites will be on the floor instead. One exception to this argument could be if beds increase humidity and by having the skin flakes on the floor, there would be fewer dust mites because the floor is less humid. I'm just guessing about this and I don't know the answer. This page says, quote, the ideal circumstances for dust mites are when we're in bed with them at night, making things all humid and warm under the covers with our perspiration, end quote. The same article also says, quote, simply providing breathing room throughout the day could be enough to reduce their numbers. We know that mites can only survive by taking in water from the atmosphere using small glands on the outside of their body, lead researcher Stephen Pretlove told the BBC when the research was released. Something as simple as leaving a bed unmade during the day can remove moisture from the sheets and mattress so the mites will dehydrate and eventually die. Still, not everyone is convinced that simply leaving your bed unmade each day would have enough of an impact on humidity in the bed to reduce dust mite population numbers, even in the UK. It is true that mites need humid conditions to thrive and cannot survive in very dry, desert-like conditions. Andrew Wardlaw from the British Society for Allergy and Clinical Immunology, who wasn't involved in the research, told the BBC. However, most homes in the UK are sufficiently humid for the mites to do well, and I find it hard to believe that simply not making your bed would have any impact on the overall humidity. End quote. Another possible argument in favor of dust mite bed covers could be the following. Maybe you do hurt dust mites when you move around on your bed, and by getting covers, the skin flakes would fall onto the floor instead of getting stuck in the bed itself. Assuming you don't walk around on the floor very much, maybe you'd hurt fewer total dust mites that way. Anyway, I have no idea if this is true, and the opposite might also be true that you might hurt more mites by stepping on the floor than you hurt in your bed. This paper has an interesting graph of dust mite abundance based on month of the year. As one would expect, mites are most abundant in the humid and warm summer months. The paper concludes as follows, quote, We hypothesize that house dust mite populations in homes survive dry periods, particularly winter months, as quiescent protonymphs. They provide the major breeding stock for population growth in the spring. Significant numbers were not recovered in the vacuumed dust samples during the winter, presumably because they were glued to the various substrates. However, as relative humidity begins to increase to more optimal levels in the spring, active tritonymphs emerge from these quiescent protonymphs. End quote. Now I'll read some more snippets of information on dust mites from a few other sources. Wikipedia says, quote, The European house dust mite, Dermatophagoides, Terranosinus, and the American house dust mite, Dermatophagoides ferrini, are two different species, but are not necessarily confined to Europe or North America. A third species, Euroglyphus mani, also occurs widely. 
unlike scabies mites or skin follicle mites, house dust mites do not burrow under the skin and are not parasitic. The average life cycle for a male house dust mite is 10 to 19 days. A mated female house dust mite can last up to 70 days, laying 60 to 100 eggs in the last five weeks of her life. End quote. This page says, quote, The mites tend to be most numerous in warm homes with high humidity. Optimum conditions for growth and development are around 75 to 80 degrees Fahrenheit and 70 to 80 percent relative humidity. House dust mites absorb and lose moisture through their skin and are very vulnerable to dehydration. Consequently, humidity levels within the home have a significant effect on survival. Dust mites cannot survive well at relative humidities below 50%. Although mite populations tend to be low in dry climates, most homes throughout the United States are capable of supporting dust mites. Food is seldom a problem for house dust mites. Their primary food is skin scales, dander, contained in house dust. People and pets regularly shed small flakes of skin from their bodies as the skin continually renews itself. Since the greatest fallout occurs in areas of human and pet activity, the mites tend to be most numerous in beds, overstuffed sofas and chairs, and adjacent carpeted areas. Relative humidity also tends to be higher in these areas because people perspire and exhale water vapor where they sleep and lounge. Mattresses, sofas, carpet, and other soft furnishings trap and accumulate dust, dander, and moisture, making them ideal microhabitats for mite development." End quote. This page says, quote, House dust mites feed on human skin scales, pollen, fungi, bacteria, and animal dander. Studies have shown air-conditioned homes have 10 times fewer dust mite allergens than non-air-conditioned homes." End quote. This page reports, quote, after eggs hatch, a six-legged larva emerges. After the first molt, an eight-legged nymph appears. After two nymphal stages occur, an eight-legged adult emerges. The life cycle from egg to adult is about one month, with the adult living an additional one to three months. The diet is varied with the primary food source consisting of dander, skin scales, from humans and animals. However, needed nutrients can be provided from fish food flakes, pet food, fungi, cereals, crumbs, etc. End quote. This paper says, quote, The American house dust mite, Dermatophagoides ferrini, and European house dust mite, D. ternosinus, commonly occur in homes worldwide. These species are the sources of multiple potent allergens in house dust. A four year survey of mites in bedroom and family room carpets and couches in 252 homes of asthmatics located in eight different geographical areas of the United States found that most homes, 81.7%, were co-inhabited by both D. ferrini and D. ternosinus. In homes co-inhabited by both species, one species was predominant and constituted more than 74% of the combined total mite population in the dust samples. However, within a geographical area, the predominant species varied between homes. In the remaining homes in which only one mite species was present, 18.3%, interestingly, some contained only D. ferrini, whereas others contained only D. ternosinus. Similar differences in house dust mite species prevalence 
have been reported in other less extensive surveys. End quote. This paper says, quote, how stust mites belong to the suborder Astigmata and family Pyroglyphidae. However, mites belonging to other families are also present in house dust, and the term domestic mites includes both mites from the pyroglyphidae family, or dust mites, and mites from other families. Thirteen species have been found in house dust, three of which are very common in homes worldwide and are the major source of mite allergen. The most common of these species are Dermatophagoides farinae, Dermatophagoides ternosinus, and Euroglyphus mani, which are found in temperate climates. Worldwide and in the United States, the most prevalent pyroglyphid mites found in homes are D. farinae and D. ternosinus. E. mani may also be prevalent in some temperate geographic areas and at times their density may even exceed that of D. farinae and D. ternosinus. House dust mites reproduce sexually. In the female, the sperm is stored in a seminal vesicle and released into the oviduct to fertilize the egg during ovulation. House dust mites are 70% to 75% water by weight, and they obtain and maintain their water balance primarily by absorbing water from the water vapor in air. Dust mites obtain water from the air by secreting a hyperosmotic solution from the supracoxal glands that open just above the first pair of legs. End quote. There's a whole book written about dust mites. Here are some quotes from it. Quote, Male D. ternosinus will mate either with active females or may take up station close to a quiescent tritonymph and wait for it to molt. The males are able to determine which of the quiescent tritonymphs will molt into females with a very high degree of accuracy. It seems likely that the major sensory cue is chemical and that males are able to tell the tritonymphs apart on the basis of sex pheromones secreted from the lateral opisthosomal glands. During copulation, the male and female are positioned facing opposite directions. The male is held in position by its anal suckers attached to the posterior opisthosoma of the female, and also possibly by the suckers on the tarsi of legs four. The female continues to move about, even feeding, while the male is dragged behind her. The pair may remain in copula for up to 48 hours. This very long duration is because the diameter of the oval immotile sperm is about the same as the tip of the penis, circa 1.5 to 2 micrometers, and sperm are probably ejaculated in single file. The sperm are pumped by muscles at the base of the penis at the rate of about 150 to 230 contractions per minute. The brain of Dermatophagoides ternosinus occupies about 1.5 to 1.6% of body volume. End quote. Here's an aside that I'm adding as commentary. The statement just quoted about brain volume being about 1.5 to 1.6 percent of total volume suggests, assuming we take the brain to have the same density as the body, that the brain to body mass ratio for these mites should be something like 1 to 64 in that ballpark. In contrast, the brain to body mass ratio for humans is about 1 to 50. So mites are in a similar ballpark as humans as far as that ratio. Some smaller animals, like ants and shrews, have even more brain per body mass. Now I'll continue reading from the Dust Mites book, the section on sensation. Quote, most of the CT on the body function as mechanoreceptors, detecting vibration of the air or substrate, 
aiding in locomotion and navigation through the detection of other objects and gravity. Mites are blind in the sense that they lack organs that are capable of forming an image. Dust mites exposed to an incandescent light source may show what appear to be photonegative responses, but it is difficult to differentiate the effects of heat and light. For a MISO 1975A conducted an experiment on the response of D. Fahrenheit to different wavelengths of 350 to 800 nanometers. There was no response at 350 to 475 nanometers and 700 to 800 nanometers. The response was positive at 500 to 575 nanometers, green part of the spectrum, and negative at 600 to 675 nanometers, orange red part of the spectrum. These data indicate that dust mites possess photoreceptors. Where they are is not known. Dust mites respond readily to changes in humidity, but organs that detect these changes have not been identified. The best educated guess is the supracoxal CT based on their proximity to the opening of the supracoxal glands that are known to function in water balance." End quote. This article says, quote, millions of dust mites are found in the average home and their droppings are known to trigger asthma attacks. In findings published in the journal Ethology, scientists reveal the previously unknown sociable side of house dust mites, Dermatophagoides teranosinus. We expected the mites to move to areas of higher humidity because they are dependent on air moisture to survive, said co-author Anne Catherine Melieu. However, the fact that they attract each other and prefer to move together rather than independently from one another was an important finding. When offered the choice of more than one path providing access to moisture air, mites were able to perceive which branch previous mites had chosen. More often than not, they then followed these other mites." End quote. Finally, I'll mention that I think it would be helpful to learn more about pain, preferences, learning, and memory in dust mites. There seem to be thousands of scientific papers on dust mites, but I didn't come across any that discussed dust mite cognitive abilities, at least not explicitly. Certainly, learning about dust mite behavior tells us a lot implicitly about dust mite brains and what they're capable of. The Dust Mites book that we saw mentions a bit about dust mite brains, but I didn't see any discussion of learning or cognition. I would be interested to know what causes pain to dust mites. Given that dust mites seek moisture, probably conditions of too low or too high moisture feel worse than optimal moisture conditions. Probably a temperature that's too high is painful, given that dust mites are harmed by high temperatures. Likewise, mites seek food and mates, so plausibly their drives for those things have the same general outline as in other animals, though dust mite brains are much simpler than those of vertebrates and even many other invertebrates. How about being crushed? Do dust mites have sensors to detect crushing and feel pain from it? How about drowning? While I wasn't able to find much discussion of dust mite cognition in particular, I did find a few articles about the cognition of other kinds of mites. One mite that has some similarities to dust mites is the two-spotted spider mite, Tetronicus urdici. Like dust mites, it's a non-predator and has five life stages, egg, larva, two nymphal stages, and adult. It's also about the same size as dust mites, with females being roughly 0.4 millimeters long, according to Wikipedia. I did a separate video about learning in the two-spotted spider mite, 
which I've linked to in this video's description. This completes the spoken portion of this video. Thanks to Joseph Kievsky for first introducing me to the topic of dust mites.
Thank you.